Shalom. Peace and blessings to you, my brothers and my sisters, from my Lord, my Savior, Jesus the Christ. I am so pleased you invite me. You could have invited any one of us. You chose me. You are a very discerning people. I am called Thomas. Some have even called me Doubting Thomas. Have you heard this? May I tell you something? I never liked that. No, I never liked that. Think about it. You do one thing wrong your entire life, and that's all they remember. How would you like it if you did one thing wrong, and that's all they ever said about you? You were this, you were that. I mean, how about the good things that I did? How about the fact that uh, I inspired the other apostles? Did you ever even one time hear anyone say, Oh, yes, 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 there is inspiring Thomas. Or the fact that I traveled the world to Syria, to India. Did you ever once hear them say, Oh, yes, there goes, yes, I can see him. There's world travel Thomas. Never one time do you hear this. It's always the same. Doubting Thomas here, doubting Thomas there. Well, there is a joke in this, and the joke she is on them. Do you know what it is? My name is not really Thomas. <laughs> no. No, they call me Thomas, yes, but my name given by my mother, my father on the eighth day is Judas. Yeah, not the not the not your your, your Judas the Iscariot, the Judean Judas, not him. I'm talking Judas after the great general Maccabees, Judas Maccabees. Do you know him? You must know of Judas Maccabees. There's a book about him. It's where you learn of the menorah, the great general. Many peoples were named Judas after Judas Maccabees. But they do call me Thomas. And Thomas, it means twin. And I thought to myself, twin to who? I have no brother, no sister I am twin to. Twin to who? Some have said, well, I think he is twin to Jesus. Don't believe this. Don't believe this. I am not twin to Jesus. That is wrong. So I started to think to myself, what is it about me that is different? That, that I would be twin to something? What do I do that is different? Ah, I ask questions. I ask questions. Over, over my life, since I was very little, I would ask, when I was very small, I asked the little questions. Why is the desert so dry? Why is the water so wet? Why is the sky so blue? When I was older, I asked big questions. Is there God? How do we know there is God? When I met Jesus, I asked the important questions. How can such bad things happen to such good people? Do you ask questions? Yeah. Perhaps I am twin to you. Yes? Yeah. I was born, I was raised in a place called Bethsaida in Galilee. And it was there that I was raised by my father to be a fisherman. But he died when I was young. So I was then raised by my uncle and he taught me to be a carpenter. I grew up with two professions. In my day, to have two professions, that's remarkable. But I learned that because I was a builder, a carpenter, just as Jesus, we had a bond. It was a special bond between us. We talked about it many, many times. In fact, I believe, I truly believe that it is because of this bond, Jesus and me being builders, that is why I was his favorite. I know he was asked many times, who do you like the best? Who is your favorite? And he would never answer it. Well, he was very good like that. But he knew, I knew, we were there. We were bonded together as the only builders. Well, the first time I ever saw Jesus was in the Jordan River. I was a follower of a man named John. We call him the, the, the baptizer because he used to baptize people in the Jordan River. And this day, I was there on the side and I was helping people to come down into the river. There was a line of people there that came to see John. He's in the water, there off to the side. And this one man, I'm help, I don't even see his face. I help him down into the river. But just as I see his back and he's walking to John, the face of John changed. He started to tremble. His face was changed. It was a different face. And I could see John say to this man, I cannot baptize you. And I heard the man say, but you must baptize me. And so I watched as John reached his hands down into the water and he's raising the water, but his hands are shaking. And the water is coming through and trembling all over and he, he's, he pours the water over the head of Jesus. And as the water is coming down, the clouds, they darken. I never saw anything like this. And as the clouds darken, a dove flew overhead. And just as the dove flew over the head of Jesus, I heard from the heavens a voice. 
And the voice said, This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. That was a voice from the heavens. From that moment, I knew. I knew. I had not even seen his face. I knew that this was the Messiah. Now, many people have said that I doubted he was Messiah. Have you heard this? Never one time. Never one time in my life did I ever doubt that Jesus was Messiah. From that moment, I knew in my heart, my mind, that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the Messiah of my peoples. But what does Messiah mean? Messiah means chosen one, chosen by God, anointed, yes? David, King David of David and Goliath, he was called Messiah. Uh, Maccabees, the one I was named for, he was a Messiah of my peoples. Jesus was Messiah. Never, never, never doubted this. Well, the next time I saw Jesus was at Lake Genesaret. I worked at that Lake Genesaret. I worked for Zebedee. He's the father of James and John. I grew up with him. I grew up in Bethsaida. I grew up with Simon. I grew up with Andrew. I grew up, grew up with James. I grew up with John. And they got me the job working for Zebedee, who owned the fish company. And I fished. But as soon as Zebedee learned that not only was I a fisherman, but I also was a carpenter, a builder, well, there was no end of the work. I would fish the whole time I was supposed to fish. After I was finished fishing, he'd say, he'd say, Thomas, come here, come here. I have this for you to fix, to build, to do this, do that. I was always working. But it was good because it raised more money for me and for my family. Well, one day I was finished with the fishing and I was working on a project of wood of some type. I don't even remember. And over to the side, there was Jesus again. I saw him there. He was there. He was sitting and he was talking with the others. I was working and they were all talking together. So I finished up the project I was working on. And I went over and I sat down on the outside of the circle. And I just started to listen to them. And they were talking this and Jesus was saying this. But then I started to ask questions. And then James was tired of my questions. And so James says, Jesus, would you tell Thomas to stop asking the questions? He's interrupting. And do you know what Jesus said? This is how I know I'm special to Jesus. Jesus said, no, I will not stop Thomas from asking the questions. It is how we grow in our faith when we ask the questions. Always ask questions. Question your faith. You grow in your faith. Well, sometime later, I was back at the Jordan River. And when I was there this day, there were soldiers that were there. They were sent by Herod. King Herod was very angry at John. You see, John was a person who always said what was on his mind, what he believed in his heart. He would speak out. And here was John saying that what King Herod was doing, marrying the, the wife of his brother Philip, was wrong. He was sinning. He was sinning against God. And so John the Baptist was there, and he was saying, King Herod must repent. He must repent of his ways. He can't live this way. That is wrong. And the soldiers were saying, you must be quiet. You must stop saying these things about King Herod or we are going to have to arrest you and John would look at them and say don't you tell me you tell him you tell King Herod that he must change his evil ways he must straighten the path he must act differently he must stop sinning before God where the soldiers came they took John they dragged him out of the river and in chains they took him away well we learned that he was put in a prison cell and on a particular day, it was a celebration. It was the birthday of King Herod. There was a large party, a gathering. And at one point, the daughter of Herodias came to King Herod and said, What could I give you on your birthday? And he said to her, I would like you to dance for me. He said, All you need to do is dance for me, and I will give you anything you wish in my kingdom. So I understand that this girl, she danced a dance that you could not believe. And when she was finished, she went to, to King Herod and she said, Here is what I want. You must be a man of your word. Do you know what she asked for? She asked for the head of John on a platter. Who would even ask for such a thing? And so King Herod, I am told he did not want to do it, but it does not matter. He did. And so he ordered that John's head be cut off and brought into the party, the celebration on a platter. When many of us who were followers of John heard about this, we were broken down in tears. 
And then I was asked with a few to go to King Herod and to bring back the body of John so we could bury it. And that's what we did. I was there. I helped to bring John's body back and we buried it. And then they asked me to go to Jesus. They wanted me to tell Jesus that King Herod had just murdered his cousin. So I did. I went to Jesus. I found him and I said to him that King Herod was there. I told him of the celebration. I said, this is what happened. And a look came over the face of Jesus I cannot even describe to you. And he said to me, I need to be alone. I need to be alone. So I held Jesus down to a boat and I said to him, I said, you just go out and you just be alone. And Jesus went and he got into the boat. But just as he was taking off from shore, a group of people saw him. They were saying, there's the rabbi. There's the rabbi. So they started to follow. Come back. We have to ask you questions. We need you to help us. And Jesus did what Jesus always does. He brought the boat right back to shore. He got off and he started to teach them, to answer their questions, and he even to heal them. And there were so many of them that this went on for hours and hours and hours. Jesus needed to mourn, but he put other people's first. That's my Jesus. That's your Jesus, yes? Well, it was getting very late. So I and some others, we went to him and we said, Jesus, you must send these people home. They've been here a long time. They must go home. They're getting hungry. They must leave. And Jesus asked, he says, well, why don't we feed them? And we said to Jesus, you, we, don't, we can't feed them. We don't have enough food. And it would cost seven or eight hundred days wages to feed these people. We can't feed them. But then Jesus says, well, let's feed them. Gather the food we have together and we will feed them. So we went and gathered the food. We brought it to Jesus. We only had five loaves of bread and two fishes. That's all we had. But Jesus took the five loaves of bread, the two fishes, and we watched as he raised them up to heaven. And he asked God's blessings on them, and he broke the bread, and he said to bring the baskets, and he put them in the baskets. And then he told us, he says, would you tell the people to sit down right where they are? And then we were to pass the baskets up and down through the people. And that's what we did. Do you know that when we finished passing the, ba passing the baskets up and down through the rows of the people, we picked up the scraps after everyone had eaten, what, what eaten was completely satisfied and was full. We picked up the scraps. And do you know that the scraps filled 12 baskets? That was a miracle, yes? How many people do you think we fed that day? I know some people say 5,000. Have you heard this? Let me tell you something. You should read your book. Your book says we fed 5,000. But then it says we fed 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. I am telling you, with Jesus, there were always many more women and children that were there that were following. We fed 20 plus thousand that day. That was a miracle of God. Don't tell me he is not the Messiah. Well, after they had eaten and Jesus had spoken to them and he felt he was tired, we said to him, you must be alone. You must mourn the death of your cousin. So he was going up the side of the mountain and, and he said to us, he said, you go to the boat, you go across the lake, I'll meet you in Bethsaida the next day. We said, fine. So we watched as Jesus went up behind on the rocks and we went down to the boat. But do you know that just as we pushed off and we were on our way across the lake, the weather changed. I don't think in all my life I saw the weather change so rapidly on the lake. It, it got darker and the, the wind was coming and the rain was coming. And then the fog came in and the boat was blowing this way. It was blowing that way. That We were being raised up and it was dropping and being pushed this way and pushed this way. And we were frightened. And we were praying for help for God to help us, to help us. And then... All of a sudden, coming right over across the water, we saw a figure of a person. We thought it was a ghost. And we started to call to God, there is a ghost, there is a ghost, please save us. And then we heard a voice. The voice said, be not afraid. 
It is I. And Peter stood up on their boat. He said, that is the voice of Jesus. That is the voice of Jesus. And do you know what he did? He stepped right out of the boat. He stepped out of the boat and was walking to tell what kind of a prayer. I grew up with Peter. This was not surprising to me. He would always do things and then think about it later. He steps out of the boat and begins walking to Jesus. And he is walking. He's getting closer to closer to Jesus. On top of that water, he's walking. And all of a sudden, a wave comes. And Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus and looks to the wave. And just as he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink. And he starts to call out, I need help. I need help. And Jesus, as he was walking to the boat, reaches down to help Peter to bring him to the boat. We pull Peter onto the boat. Jesus gets into the boat. We are sitting there and we said to Peter, what were you thinking? But just as we were relaxing in the boat when feeling safe and secure, the weather got even worse. The wind was blowing harder than ever. The boat was being turned all this way and being turned all this way. And we felt as if we were going to turn over. And the wind kept blowing harder and harder. And we prayed to Jesus. We said, you've got to save us, Jesus. You've got to save us. And do you know what he did? He raised his hand. That's all he did. He's sitting next to us on the boat and he just raises his hand and the wind stopped. What kind of a person can just raise their hand and stop the weather? Don't tell me Jesus is not the Messiah. There's no doubt in my mind as to who he is. He was the Messiah. Well, many times where Jesus was, was people would come round. Many times there were few people. Many, many times there were great multitudes of people. And one time we were there on the side of a hill. And Jesus was teaching this. He said, Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And he said, Blessed are the peacemakers. Do you need peacemakers in your world today? He said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And then he said, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see the face of God. Did you hear what I said? If you are not pure of heart, you will not see the face of God. God has rules. God has consequences, yes? Well, he also do you know, taught us to pray. We were raised to pray. All of us were raised. To, we were taught by our parents and the rabbis to pray from the time we were very small. But we noticed that Jesus prayed differently than did we. I remember he told us this. He says, you pray, you pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Did you hear what I said? Jesus is saying, if you are not willing to forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We knew how to pray. We were taught, uh, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. We were taught this hero, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. We were taught from the time we were very small. But Jesus taught us a new way to pray. We were also there and watched as he performed miracles. He would make the, the lame to walk and the blind to see, the deaf to hear. Once, once I remember, this man came to him. He was blind. But he was different. He was blind from birth. And I saw Jesus. The man came to him and Jesus went down to the ground and he picked up dirt. And he, he spit in the dirt. And he made a salve with the, with the sand, the dirt, and mud. And he took the mud and he put it onto the eyes of the man blind from birth. And the man was told to go and wash his eyes. And do you know when he did? He was able to see. Now why is this? The, by the way. I know some people, they say, oh, they laugh. They say, he spit in his hand, the saliva, he spit. You will see, in my day, we believed. 
the more powerful the man, the more powerful the saliva. Now you may laugh at that and think, well, we're smarter than that. We know different today. Let me tell you, 2,000 years from now, they will laugh at what you do for medical reasons, yes? Well, Jesus uh, healed this man. The man came back, he could see. Why was this so amazing? Many men who had, women who had been blind had been healed, but never, 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 never before Jesus was someone healed who was blind from birth. That's Jesus. That's the power of the living God through Jesus Christ. Yes? Well, once I was traveling with everyone and we were there and two sisters, friends of Jesus came, Mary and Martha. They said to Jesus, our brother Lazarus was ill and asked that he would please come to him. And Jesus said, you need not worry, your brother will live. Well, after two days, Jesus said, let us go back to look at to, to, and, and to, to be there with Lazarus. Well, some amongst those other apostles, they said to Jesus, you can't go back. You can't listen to them. You can't even think of going back. You go anywhere near Bethany. You go anywhere near Jerusalem. The last time you were there, they nearly stoned you to death. You can't even think of going back. But then I spoke up. I said, do you hear yourselves? Do you hear yourselves? We follow this man. We tell him we believe he is the Messiah. If we truly believe he is the Messiah, we must be willing to follow him. No matter what, suffer whatever the consequence, even if it means to die, we must be willing to follow him. Well, Jesus looked up and said, we will go back. That was inspiring, yes? But did you ever once even say, inspiring Thomas? No, it's always the same. Doubting Thomas. Doubt this, doubt that, doubting Thomas. Sometime later, we met in a place that we call the upper room for what you call the Last Supper. And uh, before I go on, how many people do you think were there at the Last Supper? How many people? Most people say 13. Is that what you think? Yeah, the 12 of us and Jesus, yes? Yes, yes, six on one side of the table, Jesus, and the other six on the other side of Jesus. Yes, six, Jesus, six. Is that what? No, no, that was just for the picture. No, if it was just the 13 of us, question, who cooked? Who cooked? You would not want to taste what I cook, and I've tasted what Simon cooks. I would rather eat my sandal. Now, who cooked? There was always many, many people with us, with Jesus. They were family. They were friends. They were children. And this day, Jesus knew something that none of us knew. This was going to be his last meal with us. So there were many, many more people there than there were normally at this meal. And I remember Jesus said to us that, that he was going to leave. And he was going to, to prepare a place for us. That his, in his father's house there are many mansions, he said to us. And he was going to prepare a place for us. And that we would know the way. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean we will know the way? You are going to a place we have never been. How will we know the way? And Jesus looked at me and he said, well, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And you come to the Father through me. But then Philip there, he asked the question. He heard this and he asked the question. He says, well, how do we know the Father? And Jesus says, if you know me, you know the Father. You know the Father, you know me. Well, we heard Jesus teach us many, many times. He said many things to us. And most times we thought we knew what he said. But we found later that we took a long time to truly understand in our heart and our mind what it was that Jesus was saying. But later that night, we all gathered together at a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And we were all there. We'd been praying with him and talking with him. And then all of a sudden, soldiers came. And they were led by one of our own, Judas, the Iscariot. He came, he led the soldiers right to Jesus, and they took Jesus. Do you know he betrayed him with a kiss? Can you imagine this? He betrays our Lord Jesus with a kiss. And they take Jesus and they put him into chains. Now, Peter, Simon Peter, finally jumps up. He was asleep, and they woke him up. He jumps up, and he takes the knife. The little knife, it, it, it kept into his, his belt. He, he took it. It was the knife he uses to gut the fish. And he started to swing his knife like this. And he sliced off the ear. 
not of one of the guards. He sliced off the ear of one of the slaves of the temple guards. Let me tell you, as far as he was as a swordsman, Simon made a much better fisherman. Well, Jesus, Jesus saw what happened. Even though he was already tied with his hands, he leaned down and he picked up the ear of from the guard, the slave of the guard, and he put it onto the head and he healed that man right there. Jesus knows he is being taken away. And yet he does what Jesus always does. He takes time out for another person. Well, they took him away. And they put him on a mockery of a trial. And they found him guilty. And they took him out. And they crucified him. And most of us were not even there. Most of us were out someplace else. They were hiding. The only one of us that was there at the foot of the cross was John. And to this very day, I give praise, glory, and honor to John for being the only one of us who had the strength to be there at the foot of the cross. I was there, but I was at a distance. I was too frightened to be there. I saw as Jesus was forced to carry his cross. And I was watching him as he was falling, and, and he fell again. And they made this man, this man named Cyri Simon from Cyrene, to come out to help him to carry the cross. And I saw as they brought Jesus to the hill and they pushed him down to the ground. I saw as they stretched out his hands onto the cross and they put nails, they hammered nails into his hands, they hammered nails into his feet and I watched his face flinch with the pain. And then I watched as they raised up his cross and in the ground they set it and he shrieked with pain. And I can see from the distance I am watching him. And I can see him and I see his head go down and his head go back up. And he's trying to push himself up to breathe because he is suffocating. And I hear him say, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? But he also said to the people, he says, Father, you must forgive them. <laughs> These people are killing him. And he says to his Father, you must forgive him. <laughs> That's what Jesus is. I watched as he raised his head for the last time and his head fell and he was dead. I saw as a soldier came and he took a sword and put it through his side. Well, after some time, people had dispersed and Jesus was dead and there were only John and the two Marys that were left, a few others. And I finally felt safe that I could go. So I came to where they were and I helped them as they took Jesus down from the cross. And Jesus was laid out and they took, they, they took the linen to bury him with and as they stretched out the linen I was there and I was helping them to pull Jesus' hands together and wrap him into the linen and one of his hands fell out and hit me right on the leg I had Jesus' blood on my tunic I never washed the tunic. I wanted to be reminded of the blood he shed for me. Every time I saw that blood, I was reminded of Jesus. We wrapped him into the cloth and a group of us carried him to a, the tomb of a friend of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea. And we placed him into the tomb and we watched as they rolled the rock in front of that tomb. And I remember I left, I wandered through the streets of Jerusalem and all I could think of was my Messiah was dead. My Messiah who I for three years have given my life to, who I believed in. They have killed him, they have murdered him. What was I going to do? What was I going to do? I wandered the streets of Jerusalem. My life was over. They, they had killed and murdered my Messiah. What was I going to do? And on the second day of the week, my friends came to me. 
And they said, Thomas, we've been looking for you. Jesus has come to us. And I said, Jesus has not come to you. I know I was there. You were not there. You're hiding someplace. I was there. I held him. I held his limp body, his arms. He is dead. He is not coming back. And they said, we are telling you, Thomas, he has come back. He has spoken to us. I said, Jesus could bring people back from the dead, but he is gone. There is no one to bring him back. And they said, no, no, Thomas, we are telling you he came to us. So I said to them, why do you play this cruel joke? I will not believe. I will not believe that Jesus has come back until I, with my own hands, feel the holes in his hands, the holes in his feet, and the holes in his side. Only then will I believe. Well, on the eighth day of the week, we were in the upper room, and I was sitting and talking to others and facing off to the side. And then I heard a voice. It was the voice of Jesus. And I heard him say, be not afraid. And I remember as I turned, there he was standing there. And he saw me, he began to walk to me and he said, peace be with you, Thomas. I want you to please take your hand. And I said, no, no, don't ask me to do that. He said, I want you to take your hand and put it into the holes in my hand, the holes in my feet, and the hole in my side. I said, I will not do it. I don't need to do it. I can see you there. And Jesus took my finger, and he put it into the hole in his hands. He put it into the holes in his feet, and he took my hand and put it to the hole in his side. And I said to him, my Lord and my God. You see, it was not whether he was Messiah or not. That is what I, not what I did not know or did not believe. What I did not know was that Jesus was God. He came to me and he said, Blessed are you, Thomas, for you have seen and you believe. But he said, More blessed are those who have not seen and yet still do believe. He was with us a short while. And many of us, we came together. And we decided we would spend the rest of our life proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Where I was sent to the areas in the east, Syria, and to India. And there's many stories of me there. Most of them are not true. Uh, but I like, so would you like to hear one? It's not true, but I like it. I was there in Syria. The king of Syria, he came and he said, I hear you're a good builder. I would like you to build me a mansion. I said, yes, I will do this. And he gave me money to build a mansion. But I took his money and I gave it to the poor and the needy and the homeless. I gave it away, all of it I gave away. And the king heard of this. So the king came to me and he says, he said, I hear that you have taken my money that I gave you to build a mansion and you gave it away instead. And I said, no, no, I gave it away to, to the poor, the homeless, because I was building you a mansion, not in this world, but in the next. The king did not like that. So he ordered that I be executed. So he had me down on the ground. And as the man was raising the sword to cut off my head, the brother of the king drops dead. When I saw this, I went over to him. I put my hands on him and I prayed. And do you know, he came back to life. And he says to his brother, the king, you cannot kill this man. He says, I have just died. I have been to the other side. I have seen the mansion he has built for you. Very nice story, yes? I wish it were true. I questioned all the time I asked questions of Jesus. So I want to encourage you to question and grow in your faith through your questions. Ask the people who know more than you. You grow in your faith when you question your faith. That's how you grow. But what is faith? Faith is believing in something you can't see, but you have a reason to believe in it. I learned it this way. When I was very small, my mother would take me to a market. It was owned and it was run by a man named Yosef. And she told Yosef one day 
to take your bags of grain, of rice, and of wheat, and to take off the signs. And she told me, she said, Jewish, you go and you get the bag of rice. So I went over, I got the bag of something. I brought it to my mother and I said, here you are. And my mother said, what's in this bag? And I said, rice. And she asked me, how do you know? I said, well, I, I, well I'm guessing. She says, yes, that is not faith. Put it back. And I put the bag back. Then she asked Yusuf to go and put the signs back on the bags. I went over and I looked and the one that said rice, I picked it up. I brought it to my mother and I said, here you are. And my mother asked me, she says, Judas, is this, this the bag of rice? I said to her, yes, it has a sign. Ah, you have faith that there is rice. You don't know until you open the bag. Yusuf could have made the signs wrong, yes? Faith is believing in something you can't see, but you have a reason to believe in it. I'm going to leave you now with this. Jesus, and you may not know this, never, never said goodbye to us. Never once. But what he did say was this. He said, I will never, never leave you. Not even until the end of time. Shalom.